Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Summer of Carnage right here on the Venom Vlog, and we are nearing the end. We have one more episode after this, and so since I saw a lot of movie news coming out and some other comic news too, I figured we'd do it all in one video real quick. So I have like five links here that we're going to go through that talks about uh, here, right? Obviously our first piece of news is Stephen Graham joining the cast of Venom 2 in an undisclosed role right now. We don't know who he's playing, uh, but this is great. I've been a big fan of his since the movie Snatch, I think is when I first saw him, and he played a character named Tommy. Um, um, and uh, he was awesome. He's very funny in that movie, but he was also, you know, uh, when he tried to like toughen up, it was kind of a cool moment for the character as well. And then he's went on to do great things like in Boardwalk Empire, where I think he played Al Capone. Um, and then he also was just recently in The Irishman. So uh, very good stuff. And he's done a lot of great stuff. If you look up his, uh, you know, his resume and his IMDb page, you'll see he's done a lot of great stuff. So I figured we would talk about this as our first piece of news. And this is from Variety, Justin Kroll over at Variety. And he, uh, I, I don't know if they broke the news on this or Deadline did. I saw Deadline posting about it too. So I don't know who got to it first, uh, but it, this is just where, you know, we're going with Variety today since that was the article that I retweeted yesterday. And uh, it says, Stephen Graham is set to join Tom Hardy and Michelle Williams in Sony's Venom 2 with Hardy returning as the titular anti-hero. Andy Serkis is set to direct and Naomi Harris and Woody Harrelson are also on board. Sony had no comment on the casting so far. Uh, so yeah, they're keeping it tight under wraps, I guess, who he's playing. And I'm intrigued. I mean, you know, I think he would make a good bad guy in the movie. It's funny that he's playing Al Capone, and I think Tom Hardy just recently played Al Capone in one of his movies, Fonzo. That'll be coming out, I think, next year, directed by Josh Trank, who did uh, Fan 4 Stick. For a lot of you out there who don't know what he's done, he's also done Chronicle as well. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see. So it's like two Al Capones in one movie now with Tom Hardy and uh, Stephen Graham here. And then also Naomi Harris has been, you know, rumored to be Shriek and Variety, I think, kind of broke that storyline, too, or that that possible um casting as well and so it says the original film was a huge hit for the studio when it premiered in 2018 grossing 213 million on the domestic box office and a massive 856 million worldwide i mean yeah this movie was a hit and that's what we're going to talk about next because there's actually a couple interviews from uh, the producer matt tolmack uh, there's a couple interviews he did and they were broken up over you know numerous articles obviously because websites got to get their clicks in uh, but we're going to look at those real quick after this uh, and he in, in comment on that as well so uh, plot details or, you know, comment on the success of the movie. Uh, plot details are being kept under wraps and it's unknown who Graham will be playing in the sequel. Uh, Variety exclusively reported that Harris would be playing the villain Shriek, who's also the romantic interest of Carnage Harrelson earlier this year or earlier this fall. But I don't we don't know if that's 100 percent confirmed yet. Uh, we do know she's in the movie, I guess, or they were in talks of it. But I don't think anything has been confirmed yet by Sony. Uh, so, you know, kind of take all this with a grain of salt to an extent, but I would trust, you know, bigger uh, sites like this and Deadline and stuff. I'd kind of trust their reporting on this because chances are they do know someone in the know who, you know, updated them on this. So, uh, yeah, this is great news. I love uh, Stephen Graham. He's so awesome, and I think he's going to make a great addition to the cast of Venom 2. So let me know your thoughts down below, and then let's get to the next story. These next two quick articles come from comicbook.com. So again, I'll put links to all these down below that we're talking about. And uh, it says Jenna Anderson, but I believe, I can't remember the person's name who actually went down uh, to interview Matt Tolmack, but he's right now doing press for his movie Jumanji 2, The Next Level. And uh, and so he produced the first one and that was obviously a big hit. And now he's, you know, you know coming back to do the second one. And while he was, you know, there, it, you know, I can't remember where they were in Hawaii or somewhere. They went somewhere really cool and tropical and it was beautiful looking, beautiful location. I I saw pictures of The Rock posting about it and uh, Kevin Hart posting about it on uh, Instagram. And I think, uh, you know, the other cast members also who I follow, all of them on Instagram. And uh, the first movie I, I thought was kind of fun. I honestly thought it was, it took me a long time to see it. I didn't see it when it first came out. I just watched it like a month ago, but I actually thought it was a pretty fun movie. And, uh, and so Matt Tolmack is now doing the press rounds for that. And of course, since he's the producer of Venom also and Venom 2, he's going to get asked Venom 2 questions, just like when, you know, way back when he was doing uh, press for, I think, Jumanji 1 and other things, he was getting a bunch of questions for, uh, for stuff. And normally I'm not a big fan of that, but I think like when you're, when you're interviewing someone, it's like get to the Jumanji questions first and, and don't like, you know, fanboy out on the comic book stuff. And they always send these comic book, you know, uh, nuts, you know, down there to like do these interviews and uh and I, i'm always like oh man like even me i'm a comic book fanatic but if you sent me to interview matt tolmack yeah i would probably squeeze in one maybe venom question at the end uh but i would probably talk to him about his current project because that's what he's there to talk about you know and i'm sure he'll expect at least one or two venom questions but it's funny his answers he keeps trying to tie it back to uh to jumanji uh because he's like yeah I'm, so if i get the impression that this person 
asked a lot of uh, Venom 2 questions, uh, but then and also Spider-Man questions because they're like, hey, is Spider-Man going to you know get in this universe? So we'll talk about that in the next article. This one is mainly about Andy Serkis and kind of how he got on board to direct this movie. And we talked about this in one of our live streams, but I wanted to cover it here too so you guys can see the article. Um, you know, Matt Tomek said, you know, Andy Serkis is a great director, but he's also an actor and he's played inside monsters and he sort of understands characters from the inside. Uh, and it's been wild to watch him with Hardy because they speak that language that only actors understand, particularly people like Tom Hardy and what it's like to be in this other character from another realm. He's like a mystical figure, Andy Serkis. And when he's around people, you feel his presence. He has, or he was having Tom do really well. And so we got uh, to know him actually through Tom. He's going to be special and it's going to be a really great connection. So yeah, we talked about that. And that was my speculation a while ago was that uh, Tom May, you know, made that uh, Ebenezer Scrooge movie, A Christmas Carol. He made that movie and Andy Serkis is in it and Tom produced it, I believe. And uh, and I think through that, they got to know each other really well. And then I, I feel, and I'm speculating here, but I feel Tom probably brought to Sony, hey, we need a director for the next movie. I just worked with Andy Serkis. He was phenomenal. And I think he would be a great choice to direct this movie since he's also a director. And it sounds like they got to know Tom through, uh, or they got to know Andy Serkis through Tom, according to, uh, you know, Matt's, a quote there. So I think my speculation is probably not too far off from what really happened, um, which is great. You know, I, I was trying to connect dots myself and I was trying not to do it as a fan connecting dots, but looking at it logically and looking at the information we had in front of us. And, and I, it looks like I'm not too far off, probably not spot on, but it seems though that Andy Serkis kind of came in through Tom. Um, and since they did recently work together, it makes sense that it might've come from Christmas Carol. So this is great. And they talked about how they have a really great relationship together and they're already meshing really well. And that's going to make hopefully for at least a fun experience on set for sure. And a, hopefully a, a slightly less stressful one than I think Tom said he went through in the first movie in various interviews. Or, or speculation stuff like people are saying he walked off set and stuff so I think with him picking the writer Kelly Marcel she came in and kind of punched up the script for the first movie near the end and she was on set with them but I think you know having her start the script and then having a director Tom likes uh, that he works really well with not that he probably didn't work well with Ruben Fleischer but it just sounds like he has a, a really good chemistry with Andy um, and so it sounds like that's you know hopefully make a really outstanding film and a better one than the first one I'm hoping. So, uh, yeah, so this is really great. I'll put the link down below. They did talk about our rating and how Joker did really, really well recently and how, um, you know, before that Deadpool did and Logan did, and it kind of set, it shows that, okay, these movies can do really well with the mass audience being rated R. Uh, but I feel like they're still not going to make the second one rated R. They do hint at, oh, maybe it's something we're thinking about and we definitely have conversations about. But I feel like with Avi Arad, I mean, he pretty much put his foot down in the last interview saying that, uh, you know, he doesn't think it needs to be rated R because Carnage appeared in the comics and those weren't mature rated comics. He appeared in the Spider-Man cartoon and that was not a mature rated Spider-Man cartoon. So he's got a point. I, I think you can do Carnage rated R. I think people who want to see rated R, it's like, well, they're not going to spend a ton of time in the movie showing Carnage cutting people up and everything like that and, and, and being a serial killer like most of that's behind him and now he's you know in jail for all those crimes so I, I don't depending on what story they write I don't think they're gonna really flesh that part out and if if you're not and you're not and you're not gonna make like a seven style movie uh, with Carnage then you don't really need the rated R aspect I feel um, so it's he, he did mention it he mentioned oh yeah Joker was successful but uh, and we talked about you know making this movie a rated R movie but since we're still gonna probably tie Spider-Man in later uh, you know, chances are we're going to keep this, you know, uh, PG-13. He doesn't say it in so many words. Uh, I'm kind of filling in a little bit of blanks there, but uh, there's more of that you can read in this article and, and one of the other ones we're going to pop up to next. Uh, but the next one we're going to cut to, I think, is also from comicbook.com, and it's about um, Spider-Man himself. So I believe in that same interview where the person from comicbook.com went over to uh, interview, you know, Matt Tomek and all the, the cast of Jumanji 2, he also asked about Spider-Man, and uh, and it was uh, Brandon Davis, I'm sorry, is the person's name, uh, from comicbook.com, and Brandon Davis was talking to Matt Tolmec and asked him different questions, and of course, eventually he got to the Spider-Man question, uh, which is, you know, wh what's the future of Spider-Man? How are you going to tie him into Venom? What's the, you know, potential there, or is there any plans? And Matt says, yes, we have big plans, uh, quote unquote, we have big plans. Um, and they say that should be enough for Spider-Fans to get their engines going. Everything said from both Sony and Marvel sides after 
after the agreement to share custody of Spider-Man was made official, as uh, hinted at this possibility. So, of course, we knew this was going to come, uh, you know, at some point. A lot of you guys were even ahead of me on that. Where with the first movie, uh, we heard that Tom Holland went to the set of the first Venom movie. I just assumed because they were filming Infinity War or whatever, right, or whatever it was, Endgame or something, like right up the street in Atlanta, I figured, hey, I'm a, I'm Spider-Man. I should go by and see what Venom's doing, and I'm a fan of Tom Hardy. And I thought he just went as a fan to the set to just check it out and to meet Tom and everything and maybe get a couple publicity shots or something. Like, that's what I thought. Uh, but uh, t- t- apparently, he may have actually filmed uh, a small scene. I, again, and I'll put my foot in my mouth if I'm wrong, I haven't seen any of that confirmed. I still see those rumors just popping back up, but I didn't see anything, as far as I know, confirmed. But if you guys know that someone from Sony specifically said one of the producers specifically said that tom went and filmed a scene then please link me down below because i don't think i came across that in my searching for it uh but i do know that he did visit the set for sure and i don't know what he did there um so that's cool that they you know they kind of brought that up a little bit um that rumor has kind of popped up again but they also you know uh, Matt has said, yeah, but we do have plans for Spider-Man. I mean, obviously, that was the whole point of the deal to, you know, um, renegotiate and get the terms back on and have them be shared with Marvel and us. Uh, the whole point of that deal the second time was obviously so we could use Spider-Man as well. So, uh, so yeah, it looks like we're going to get our Spider-Man Venom interaction at some point. I know some people are mad about that because they're like, oh, well... Venom's origins aren't tied to Spider-Man, so it's not going to feel, you know, true to the comics and all this stuff, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, but look what they look what happened when they try to do something that was true to the comics. They wedged Venom into a movie that he kind of wasn't supposed to be in and uh, and they rushed it. And and so if they're actually going to take their time at this, I would rather them just tell a good story and uh, and and still you know uh, have an interaction between Spider-Man and Venom even if it's not 100% comic accurate and you could also look at it this way if those two meet in the movie let's say Eddie Brock gets injured at some point in the movie and the suit goes over to Spider-Man, we can still get a black costume Spider-Man at some point. And then by the end of the movie, maybe Eddie Brock has to save Spider-Man by getting the suit back because Spider-Man's losing control of it or his power is radiation is corrupting the suit in some way, whatever. I mean, they can come up with a bunch of different stories and I think they'll still work and still be fun. So I'm glad that they have plans for Spider-Man and I'm glad it's a slow roll out. We do hear rumors that Spider-Man might show up as a cameo in Venom 2. We'll see about that. Um, anything we got this covered, you know, that website, site anytime anytime they post something i just ignore it so if you're out there and you're like hey they covered this news or they talked about this news it's like well i don't trust that website at all it's just a bunch of fans you know guessing at things and throwing darts at a dartboard um i don't actually believe they have any real sources um because they just act like kids whenever they get news they just run right to their website and go this our source told us this and i'm like yeah but i don't know who your source is your source could be reddit for all i know and uh and so i don't trust that website so I'm just going to stick to the bigger websites and in comicbook.com direct interviews, like anyone who talks directly to Matt Tomac or Avi Arad or Amy Pascal, anyone who talks to them directly or the cast directly, that's who I trust because at least I can hear it from their mouths, uh, you know, directly and I can know and set my expectations accordingly. This last bit of interview with Matt Tomac comes from a different website, actually Cinema Bland, and uh, this is written by Nick Evans, a great shot there of Tom as Venom, really cool looking. Um, And this is about the lesson that Matt Tomac says he learned from making the first movie, like looking back at it, you know, like what did fans like the most and what didn't they like? And uh, I thought this was kind of interesting because I I think he's dead on about this, I I believe. Um, But I'd love to hear your thoughts. So with all the other interviews we talked about just a minute ago about from Matt Tolmec, let me know your thoughts on those about Spider-Man and everything like that. But also let me know this in particular, because I'm really intrigued to hear what you guys think. If you think he took away the right lesson from the first movie Um, with any franchise, there's always lessons to be learned from the first film. uh, What worked, what didn't work, what can be used to make an even better movie the second time around. So that's what they're. uh, uh, that was their approach to, uh, with this question to Matt Tolmec and him explaining what worked in the first movie. And he says, and I quote here from Matt Tolmec, fans love that relationship. What people say all the time is the relationship between Eddie and Venom is, and I just want to spend more time with those guys. Um, and that's such a testament to Tom Hardy, who obviously played both parts. It's similar to, and I'm not just trying to tie it back to Jumanji, but it's the character. So again, yeah, people asking me these questions, he's like, well, I'm here for Jumanji, so I got to still answer with Jumanji answers. Um, but I do like that he kind of tied this in. He says, yeah, most people walked away from the first film loving the relationship between Eddie and Venom. As far as most fans were concerned, and most viewers, 
viewers, according to Matt, like his from his perspective, he believes that the thing they got right the most was Eddie and Venom uh, working together. Uh, he says, it's a thing you want to hear when you launch a franchise is that what works is the heart of the movie. And the heart of the Venom movie was always the relationship between Eddie and Venom. These two characters, these two sides that had to figure out how to live together and that were somehow better together than they were separately or more successful and what that meant. So again, he just focused on that relationship. He said, that's what made that first movie. That's what people seem to love the most is Tom working with Venom. And that was what we wanted at the heart of the film was we wanted that relationship to be the heart of the film. And it turns out that's what most people liked. And that's, I think, is why that movie was ultimately successful. I know there's a lot of people out there that, you know, hate the movie. It's not accurate. It's not this. It's not that. All the the hardcore fanboys and fangirls and stuff. Um, but to me... They get drowned out by the masses who spent money to go see this movie and who walked out with exactly, you know, uh, most of them walked out with this idea in their head, which was, wow, that v Venom and Tom Hardy, uh, Eddie Brock, you know, they worked really well together. That was the, the whole reason I saw this movie was to see Venom get brought to life and they actually made them two characters that uh, kind of had motivations. Uh, you know, Eddie Brock had a little bit more of a motivation than uh, than Venom. I think the, the symbiote, um, which I wish they didn't name it Venom in the movie, uh, you know, itself, I think together they are Venom. Uh, but either way, like that fanboying aside, uh, they still did a good job of uh, solidifying that relationship. And I wish they would have done a little bit more with the suit itself and why it chose to stay with Eddie. I mean, there is enough there to you can figure it out. But at the same time, I kind of wish they dove a little bit more into that and showed why the suit did bond with Eddie at the end and choose to save him and his world and fight against Riot. And maybe there's a past between him and Riot that they could have fleshed out a little bit more. Uh, but either way, you know, that was the relationship in the first movie. That was the heart of the film, uh, according to Matt Tolmec. And I want to hear your thoughts. I kind of agree with his comments here, and I'm glad that they're going to focus on that in the second movie. They want to build the relationship parts more. Um, I think that's a, a smart move because I think that'll help them keep the story character driven and not so much action set piece driven. Um, I'm sure some of that will be in there, but it's nice to hear that that was their takeaway. So what do you think? Do you agree with them? Do you not? Let me know down below. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic in particular. And the last bit of movie news kind of we have here is from Screen Rant. And this isn't Venom 2 news, this is more Venom 1 news. But I thought this was kind of neat that Sony is marketing a Spider-Man multiverse box set that's going to be coming out. And I'm wondering if you guys are interested in it and uh, if you even knew about it. I know some of you probably did, and I think some of you even tweeted me a link to this uh, or, or a picture of the, the box set at some point. So uh, I know you guys are probably on board, but I'd love to hear those of you who maybe didn't know this was coming, or if you did know, how excited are you? Are you going to buy this? Because I actually don't own Homecoming or Far From Home. I do own Venom and Spider-Verse, though. And to me, those are the two movies in that set that I like. Uh, so unless they add like a ton of cool new features, I don't know if I'm going to be picking this box set up myself. Um, but yeah, so Sony saw success with characters courtesy of Sam Raimi's Spider-Man trilogy. Um, he withdrew from making Spider-Man 4. They talk a little bit about that. The reboot Andrew Garfield movies 1 and 2 and how 3 was supposed to go forward. Uh, 3 and 4 were going to set up Sinister 6 and they were going to do a Venom solo movie at that point. And when all those plans fell apart, they just went with Venom, and that stuck. And then they went with Spider-Verse, which was also awesome. Um, so yeah, here we have the Venom movie account uh, tweeted. The, uh, the Spider-Man multiverse is coming together to bring you the ultimate movie gift set just in time for the holidays. Get the four movie steelbook set for yourself as a gift uh, for you or a Spidey fan in your life. And so there you go. Look at that. Um, the art is pretty awesome. You get to see like all the symbols make the spider uh, which is really cool on the, on the main steel book. So you have um, like the, the ones from each movie, I guess, or each universe. So that's really great. Inside, you get to see Venom and Spider-Man Noir side by side, which is cool because Spider-Man, oh, that's not Spider-Man Noir. I'm so sorry. That's uh, the, 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 the monkey, whatever, monkey king or whatever his, uh, his name was uh, in, the, in the second movie. Um, so that's kind of cool because he has a black suit, uh, Spider-Man kind of. So uh, yeah, that's great having them two next to each other and then having the Tom Holland uh, Spider-Man and uh, our, our friend Miles Morales down there. So yeah, it's a nice looking box set. I don't know if it's going to have any special features on it that are exclusive to this i wish that if so that's great even if it's like one or two little features where they just you know have a new interview with producers talking about the shared universe that would be great but i don't think so i think these are just going to be the four movies so for that reason i may not buy this but i figured some of you out there might um 
A multiverse has always seemed to be part of the plan. The Amazing Spider-Man films were supposed to be a launching pad for their own Spider-Man universe, but then when those two movies bombed, obviously that didn't happen. Um, the aforementioned third and fourth entries never happened, uh, but the unrelated Venom movie did, because that was always the plan, I think, was to do Amazing Spider-Man 1 and 2, and then do a, a, a Spider-Man 3 and 4, but have Venom kind of be a movie in between Spider-Man 3 and 4, and then have Sinister 6 be after Spider-Man 4, or something like that. Like, they had a, a really big, you know, rushed plan. And then when all that fell apart, they kind of retrofitted Venom to be the start of something else or kind of be its own thing. And that's, I think, why it was kind of clunky at times um, as well, is because it had remnants of a previous Adi- you know, version or edition of the movie. And then Kelly Marcel came up and punched it up to try to steer it in a, a, a new direction, you know? Um, so I think hopefully that new direction will come to fruition in the second film and it'll kind of come across more as a standalone. And then they also mentioned there's rumors of a Silk movie and a Madam Web movie and all that stuff. But I did want to mention this. This is the last bit of, uh, you know, Venom movie news. And the last thing we're going to talk about is some comic book news. So we'll dive into that right now. So this last bit of news is comic book related, and it comes from Newsarama. This is Venom 29, number one, births a new generation of symbiote. So I probably don't know if I'll review or do a discussion on this one. I have read it. It did come out last week. Uh, as of recording this video, this came out. Uh, this comic came out last week. So maybe we'll talk about it on a live stream uh, coming up. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on that. And uh, I did. I read the whole first issue. It's written by Jody Hauser. The art is really good. I, I can't remember the artist's name right now. Hopefully they'll mention that here in the, the article here. Um, but this is an interview with Jody Hauser about what she's bringing to the table with Venom uh, 2099. And it's cool stuff. I mean, I, I like the cover. The cover is amazing. The story itself was fine. Like I said, I'll talk about. Oh, there's the artist right there. Francisco M- M- Mobley and uh, Geraldo, uh, Geraldo Borges. Uh, so, yeah, awesome. Very cool. And their art is great. I thought the book looked really nice. And the story was okay. I think uh, the ending is where it started to fall apart a little bit for me. Um, and then also the fact that they didn't really mention Cron Stone, who was the original. Venom 2099. Um, they didn't really bring him up. They bring up Alchemex, but Alchemex is working on something that feels kind of anti what they used to do. Like they used to do the anti Venom stuff, and they were during the modern day, they were making like anti Venom se- serum and stuff, um, and they kind of created agent anti-venom in a roundabout way and i thought that was great so i thought this was going to be a continuation of that but it's not it's more of a continuation of some other elements that have been brought into the comic which i won't spoil here um but this is a great interview with jody either way and so i wanted to share it and put a link down below and also just recommend that if you don't know about venom 2099 and you came here for movie news and you're kind of just looking for venom comics to read this one's pretty neat it introduces a new character a new venom um that was mentioned uh, they briefly mentioned them in the first issue of alpha of uh, 2099 Alpha, where there was a someone who had a kid, and the kid was being uh, brought into a doctor at Alchemex uh, for Skullfire disease. And Skullfire is a X Men 2099 reference, but it turns out it's a reference by name only. There's the character, you know, the character that we're meeting, doesn't have a Skullfire type ability or anything like that. She's just a young girl who gets brought into a lab at Alchemex, and she's dying of Skullfire disease, and she ends up getting injected with uh, a sample of a symbiote, and then chaos ensues after that. And uh, what's nice though, the pacing of this one, what I liked about it and why I wanted to put it in this video is because it is very, it's paced very much like the movie was. It's a single issue comic, but it's about, you know, a a person who gets the symbiote, starts hearing the voice in their head, much like Eddie Brock did the first time and it freaked him out. So in this book, it freaks her out and she's trying to find her place with this symbiote and then also go on this mission. The symbiote is kind of pulling her into, which is kind of what happened to Eddie Brock in the first movie. And it also leads her back to Alchemex to get kind of uh, revenge in a way, which is very much like how Eddie got pulled into the Life Foundation. So it mirrors a lot the movie, uh, the Venom movie, I'll be honest with you. It, it's almost beat for beat in some ways, because uh, so, it's kind of slow paced. You don't see a ton of action. You get like one or two action scenes with the character uh, growing a Venom arm and then hearing the Venom voice and seeing the Venom like little head come out and talk to her and stuff like so it has it's almost beat for beat kind of paced. Uh, in a in a 20 page comic as much as it can be uh, like the movie was and for that I found it kind of interesting I was like yeah I mean I wish it had more connection to the continuity of Kron and everything everything like that but I also know this is kind of a reboot of the 2099 universe as we talked about in my alpha episode if you haven't watched that of seek and destroy we totally went over the whole thing about uh, the world being rewritten by dr doom and a watcher uh, a watu the watcher so um yeah so of course the continuity is not going to be the same but i just felt like a few more references to it would have been nice uh, but still the book was fine and we'll 
talk about that in an upcoming live stream for sure. But I wanted to mention it here. So if you guys are out there and yeah, check out this. This is also what I loved most. The one thing missing from the movie, the first movie, which is uh, genetic memories. I really wanted that scene where the homeless woman um, jumps on to Eddie Brock in the lab and she gives him the costume. We don't see it transfer into him. Uh, we're just kind of led to believe it does. But I would have loved a scene there where he starts getting her memories. And as he's running in the woods and running back to his house, he's just seeing moments of her memories when he's walking down the street. Maybe he sees, um, you know, himself walking up to her. And so he knows, oh, this is her memories. It would have just been neat to see something like that. And so this comic does bring that in. And so I got to give Jody a lot of credit there because I feel like that's one ability from the symbiote that most writers don't even tackle that much anymore. I mean, Donny Cates does it a little bit sometimes, um, you know, but mostly everything connects to Null now. And so it kind of separate, you know, it kind of it kind of it's it's the same, but it's not the same. Um, and here you even see Noel in the picture there, and there is some Noel stuff in the comic, so uh, which I wasn't a big fan of. That was one of my weakest points in the books. But you get to see she gets all the memories of Peter Parker. Um, she gets all the memories of Eddie Brock. Um, so it's pretty neat uh, how they do that. But it's it's also confusing too because they reference something else from the symbiote that I'm like, okay, so it it can't be the Venom symbiote if it's also part of this other thing. So I'm a little lost on, on that. Maybe I got to reread it another time or two, but we'll discuss it live and you guys can give me your input. So go check out Venom 299. It's a good book and check out this interview with Jody from Newsarama. I'll put a link to that down below as well. Um, so thank you all very much. This is the end of our episode. Um, they can't hurt you. Look at that. That's cool. Um, this is the end of our episode. So I appreciate you all sticking through it. I know it was a lot of news, but there was just so much to go over and I didn't want to do five separate videos, especially considering we're, you know, we're ending uh, the show next or not the show we're ending the season with the next episode so episode 450 which i'll try to get up to you guys next week that'll be the final uh re pre-recorded episode then we'll do a couple live things moving forward from here on out uh, until january and then once we hit january like maybe second week of january i'll bring season four of the venom vlog back and we will cover news from the movie and we'll go back and look at agent venom comics and flash thompson's history as the character venom so let me know what your thoughts are on everything we covered here it's a long video but i I wanted to cover all this stuff so we were caught up so that I didn't leave anything hanging before we do our next live stream. And then anything here that we, you know, want to touch on, we can talk about again in the live stream as well. Thank you so much for watching. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and I'll see you in the future. Peace.